All right, welcome everyone to Artful Design TV, COVID-19 edition online and in quarantine. You can always find us at artful.design slash TV. I'm your host, Go Wong, and we are a multi-format weekly series encompassing artful design, music, coding, critical making with helpings of history and philosophy, and life check-ins. No experience needed. All are welcome. And as always, this is an ongoing experiment. Um, my co-producer, Kung Wu Kim, a shout out to Kung Wu for working tirelessly to help organize, to co-produce the videos, and to really make sure everything is working as smoothly as we can make it. And today's special guest co-host will be Anne Heggie. And she is um, a composer, a, a teacher, uh, a scholar, uh, a conductor, and she's the creator of The Furies, a laptopera, which we're going to talk about today. Um, how are you doing, Anne? Doing great. And I'm Here going to, and there you are. So you are currently in Oakland at the moment? I'm actually in Kensington, just north of Berkeley. North of, okay. All right. Well, yeah. well thanks for uh, co-hosting this episode of Artful Design TV. So we're going to actually be talking about embodiment, technology, opera, and the laptop opera, and asking these questions around bodies in the room, why they matter, or does it even matter, right? And, um, and today, our special guests for our virtual fireside chat will be Camille Nufi and Elena Georgieva, and we'll have them on, and they're here, and uh, we will have a conversation together once we get a bit more into the laptop opera. And uh, before we get into it, though, I feel like uh, we're all bodies in different rooms right now. But let's go to our, our usual 60-second group dance. We're going to use the same music from last time because you know what? That rocked. Um, and thanks again for the, the anonymous uh, feedback person who actually suggested this. It is awesome. So what we're going to do here is, as last time, I'm going to play this twice. First time, I'm going to play this and uh, just for you to kind of warm up, formulate your moves, is always move in ways that are comfortable to you and make this your own. And the second time through, we're gonna, we're just gonna get down. All right, y'all. I hope you got enough time to uh, get your groove on. I'm going to go back to our Zoom window and go to gallery view. And uh, so uh, I'm going to play this again. Get ready to boogie. We're going to go take it to the first end of the first refrain. And here we go. Feel free to get up off of your chairs. Like 
Like rain on a sunny day, like a million dollars that you're giving away, like a stray dog on the freeway. We'll fly, oh, 'cause we are like a team, living inside a dream. You and me doing the thing, and we'll fly. Right. Rock on, everyone. I hope that felt good. It sure did to me. And uh, y'all looking great out there. Thanks for moving together. We might not be bodies in the same room, but we are bodies in rooms moving to the same beat. So let's go back with that under our belt. Ooh, that feels good. I'm actually out of breath. I've kind of invented this dance where I'm kind of like a, like a downward lobster, and I just kind of go like that. Um, so, um, let's now get to the next segment in today's show. Well, I'm so out of breath because I'm so out of shape because I haven't left the house in a few days and, uh, whew. that brings us to thinking about stuff our segment where we post critical questions and we do our best to try to think about them. And, um, and today's topic is, well, bodies in the room, why they matter, or does it even matter? Relevant, of course, to this COVID-19 age of Zoom, which we find ourselves all really uh, just heads in screens, in little windows on the screen to, to one another. Our body is the ultimate instrument of all our external knowledge, whether intellectual or practical. In all our waking moments, we're relying on our awareness of contacts of our body with things outside for attending to these things. Our own body is the only thing in the world which we normally never experience as an object, but experience always in terms of the world in which we are attending from our body. It is on making this intelligent use of our body that we feel it to be our body and not a thing outside. So this is really thinking very much about kind of bodies um, in this age. And so, and I want to uh, kind of bring you uh, and ask you a few questions. I understand that among all the other things you're doing, you're um, a director of level four of the San Francisco Girls Chorus. And you've been teaching kind of on a twice a week basis, uh, a group of, I think about a cohort of 35 singers. Tell us a bit about that experience. Yeah, so we moved right into online Zoom rehearsals um, when the shelter in place started. And at first it was okay. They were like guided rehearsals. Um, and it's been so interesting to me how they get harder and harder. And I think as we forget what it's like to actually physically be together, the virtual being together is <laughs> harder um, and we can't do music the way we usually do so we're trying new things and new experiments vocally and a lot of solo singing but um, it's really it's really made me think about what's at the root of being in a room with other people um, and it's a lot more than seeing and hearing alone you you mentioned I think there's this idea of kind of a, a, a guided rehearsal that's what is, tell us a bit about how that, what like a rehearsal now over Zoom actually looks like. Yeah, so, um, so one of the ways I've come at it is, let's not even call it uh, so much a rehearsal as a guided practice session. So um, in a rehearsal, we would be sounding simultaneously and I would be shaping the choral sound and we'd be rehearsing small sections. In a guided practice, I say, okay, here, I share my screen and I share my sound and I give a backing track for everybody and they sing their part, but they're muted. So they have to work on independence and strength individually and sing alone. Um, and that worked fine for a little period, but now it's, it's hard when there's never any feedback. And it's been so interesting how even the girls mention, uh, it's not as easy to stand up straight because there's nobody standing up straight next to me. 
and it's not as easy to take my breath when I know I should take it because there's nobody breathing next to me. Um, we have all these small signals that come from the bodies near us and when those are missing, things get harder. Um, so it's been really interesting. Yes, so um, I, I, I guess this would be, I mean, this is the time where it's, we are really realizing, like, first of all, we're, I guess we're thankful that we can do some of these things at all. But at the same time, we're realizing just all the little nuances that kind of information that our body is actually telling yeah. us about the world as in, in, again, this idea of attending to the world. And, um, you know, what are some, you know, specific well, examples of things that you feel like have been missing in, in a um, virtual rehearsal? In a virtual. So, uh, I actually put this out to, to Facebook because um, I was like, well, let's, I really want to pinpoint some of these things. Um, and I was like, you know, I know the power of multimodal learning and that there's a lot of things that are not fully visual or fully sonic. And um, I just want to read some of the responses because there were some beautiful responses. I had Marika Kuzma, who um, was the conductor at UC Berkeley, the choral conductor for a long time. Um, wrote, breathing together, eye contact, hearing your own voice meld with other timbres. And Tina Harrington, another great choral conductor, intuiting nuanced phrase shaping, moving together like starlings, exceeding the sum of the parts musically and emotionally, hearing, feeling, group progress. So this all, idea of also what happens through the breadth of time within a togetherness. And then um, this idea of the energy in the room, like... What is that energy? I feel an energy in the room with Zoom, but it's not the same as, as and I'm, I'm just trying to, to really get into what's the difference. And somebody else was telling me, um, with Zoom, we have a sense of, so we, we recognize presence as being able to see another, being able to hear another, but we also recognize presence as the physical presence, the like, physical tactile presence of another and when we only have part of that our mind spends a lot of time trying to figure out is the person there or are they not there and that that may be a big part of zoom fatigue um, is this inner uh, inner conflict about is is there presence or not um, so many it's it's different so, I mean, for me, sometimes it feels like, I don't know, it's a, I kind of rationally, I know there are people there, but it's feels different. It is a, a very much like a, a kind of a lack of viscerality, perhaps. It's like, I rationally, I'm like, yeah, I think there are people there. They're currently like looking at a picture of me and uh, rather than maybe like, you know, me in, in physical form, uh, honestly, sometimes maybe we're kind of getting used to it. I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but sometimes I feel a little solipsistic in that I feel like I'm more like talking into the void. I don't have yes. the people out there kind of almost in a, in a good way demanding my full kind of connection and attention to what I'm saying, to what I'm doing. So in certainly giving lectures online, it, it and also it's like, if you have a lot of people in the room, you have to mute them or else like basically yes. you can hear a lot of background sound, but then you don't hear the feedback from just the breathing, the size, and you get, and all the, a lot of the nuances seem to be missing. Well, I think that's, I mean, when I think about what's at the root for me of what is musical, it's about responsiveness. And I feel like what I'm training is about listening and responding and if all they're responding to is a fixed thing, and even if I we do a, something where one sing one of our members sings one line and the rest duet with her on mute, but there's no responsiveness between members, and um, it makes me wonder at what point is it no longer musical in a like I, I think I think the Zoom answers some problems and it's efficient and reasonable but i don't know that it is replacing it's this is i don't know this is actually a replacement for and i think a lot of people reckon it's not the same but yeah i mean i i guess 
I mean, here's a big, here's a question that we certainly don't know, wouldn't know the answers to now, but like, uh, I mean, the COVID-19 will end. And I mean, the question is with how much, like with how much left destroyed or disturbed, impacted um, in its wake, right? And that's a big question, but this, this will end. And after that, what does kind of the new normal in human to human interaction look like? Will we be so relieved to be like, oh my goodness, we can be in the same room with other people? Or will we be like, you know what? Zoom is uh, is light. It, you can just kind of like do this for a lot of things. Um, but it won't end in a, it's not gonna end in a, in a now back to normal. Right. I mean, we're, the choral world is talking about like, my Valerie Saint Agat is the artistic director of the girls chorus and she's working with um, costume designers to make face masks that for singing that are full spectrum sound spectrum face masks. Um, we're talking about having rehearsals with only 10 singers. We're talking about um, it's going to be such a slow change um, that uh, it, it I think I'm more well I I'm trying not to be worried. I'm trying to, to be flexible, but but one of the things I feel adamant about and that I'm worried about is rehearsal time and that the bodies in the room matter and that they're worth paying for. It's, it's expensive to get bodies in the same room. Um, and I think it's something that is is worthwhile. And, and I think using this time to remember what we miss is important. So maybe on that note, um, this would be a good form of kind of group check-in for everyone here, is that now we've had a, at least a few weeks all to kind of live in this like Zoom heavy kind of uh, work and really social life, right? Now this is how we connect with friends and family who are who are not in the same house as we are. Um, maybe, in, well, if you like in chat, please write how you feel about that. And it may be something that you either appreciate or you feel is missing in, in this, in the zoom world that we currently find ourselves. And I know some people have already been putting some really thoughtful things into chat. Um, hmm. So if there's, there are, you know, there's some, I can start with something that's actually positive is that this is actually brought us, together like i see friends here i see people here and people i don't know people i know from all over the world kind of congregating and this is not just for this particular you know uh show but it's it's in a lot of different contexts and it gives us at least an opportunity to to kind of reconnect but then i think the other side of that is what you said is i think we in figuring out what we can do I think there's also a question of how to do it well. There's a question of quality. And I think the quality question is one that's still, it's still very dependent on, I think, what you're trying to do. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's like teaching. It's been a bit of talking to the void. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to go back to a, a time when I, we can be in the same room together. At the same time, I actually also like this as a, as a format to exchange ideas and uh, and to get together. And you know what? Like, I think I f when we actually dance, I actually feel more connected. You know, I, I see people moving and somehow there was some, because maybe I'm moving my body, something something else is, seems to be happening. Um, so yeah, a lot of, I see a lot of gratefulness that's being you know, and, there's, and also there's, also there are people who, who, who like or don't like Zoom for, for various reasons. So um, please continue to write in chat. We actually have the chat window recorded. So we, that makes it into the, the actual recording for each episode. So please feel free to, to, uh, to make yourself heard. Now, so to actually explore this further, uh, Anne and I are going to, dive into a specific instance of a musical performance context, and that is the laptopera. And before we get into what is a laptopera exactly, let's actually talk a bit about opera. And uh, I've prepared just a little short 
uh, kind of a opening here for that, and uh, I'm going to share that with you. Uh, the brightest flames burn out the quickest. Now, this is a phrase that's been applied to a lot of really iconic um, and well beloved kind of artists and, and musicians. We've heard this applied sadly to to musical icons like Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, who all might be part of, you know, all part of this so-called infamous 27 Club because they all sadly passed away at the age of 27. Now, before any of them, about 250 years before them, there was actually someone else who would have been a, also a good candidate for for this, this dubious club, right? And... Um, and that is one Giovanni Battista Pergolesi. And let me show you a photo of him right here. There he is. Now, he may not be a household name today, but he is certainly not forgotten, not by composers, music scholars, opera lovers. And if we're to look at the, kind of the history of music, you know, if we had to put, if we had to put a year on it, we might say that the Baroque period ended perhaps with the death of Johann Sebastian Bach in 1750. But it's much less straightforward to kind of put a date or a year on kind of when the following classical era, you know, as we commonly think of it, really began. Um, Pergolesi's La Serva Padrona, which translates to the servant as mistress, premiered in Italy in 1733. That's 17 years before Bach's death. And in a way, this kind of was written at a period that was kind of in this transitional period where there was still kind of the Baroque emotion as well as kind of the rise of what we think of kind of as music that followed that period. Um, and in a way, Pergolesi's La Serva Padrona was made during a crucial and extraordinary period of social transition in Europe. And this is to say, you know, music is a you know, is, is always is a kind of mirror, a product of the times and society in which it's made. Um, and uh, in the crossfading of the Baroque into the classical period really mirrored this, this extraordinary transitional time in Europe. And of course, that's kind of this, this time when we saw the shift away from the aristocracy, the clergy, and into kind of the rise of the middle class. And more than that, it was kind of this new brand of humanism that, that proclaimed that all people, not just the, the, royal, the royalty and the clergy were important. And this was really kind of the, the, the early end of the age of enlightenment. You know, again, the rise of middle class of shifting values and norms, and one that increasingly focused on the intrinsic worth of the individual, the human being, regardless of their social status. So if you actually look at the subject matter in music, specifically here, that was was portrayed by Pergolesi's La Serva Padrona, it was not kings or queens or royalty, but everyday people. In this opera, the main characters are a cunning serving girl, Serpina, who was trying to really trick her aging master, Uberto, into marriage. Now, these characters are ones whose motivations, actions, decisions, and emotions we can all relate to as everyday people, right? And Spurgeon Lacey not only tells the story, but makes us sympathetic with its characters. And this was really, as some of you may know, the rise of opera buffa, as opposed to the earlier Baroque era opera seria. This is kind of the rise of the operatic rom-com, but it's much more than that. It was not just comedy, but also commentary and a mirror to the changing social order. Now, Pergolesi spent much of his successful but all too short professional life in Naples and died in 1736. His decline in health attributed to some by his, to his quote unquote notorious profligacy, which I take to be code word for partied a little too hard. Pergolesi sadly died of tuberculosis at the tender age of 26. He didn't even make it to 27. Now, Pergolesi actually comes back quite literally in a science fiction short story called Johnny from this book by Robert Silverberg, a collection of short stories called The Conglomeroid Cocktail Party. And in the story, uh, scientists from the year 2008 built a time scooper and scoops Pergolesi weeks before his demise, right? And they do it right before his death so that they don't, to minimize the uh, changes that him living would have had on like 
subsequent history. So to bring him here to actually to Los Angeles in the year 2008, they cure him of tuberculosis um, and uh, they also teach him English. And also he gets kind of educated on music history since his time. Um, I'm going to just read you a passage from here. And this is from the point of view of the, uh, of, of the scientist. Uh, that's the first person here. One morning, I found him red-eyed with weeping. He had, he had been up all night listening to Don Giovanni and Marriage of Figaro. This Mozart, he said, you bring him back too? Maybe someday we will, I said. I kill him. You bring him back? I strangle him. I trample him. His eyes blaze. He laughed wildly. He is wonder. He is angel. He is too good. Send me to his time. I kill him then. No one should compose like that except Pergolesi. Right? And that's kind of a... Uh, and, and so in the, in the rest of this short story, Pergolesi actually um, becomes infatuated with rock and roll. He uh, joins a band called the Shining Orgasm Revival. He dazzles the audience because you know what? That's not surprising because opera back in this day was like the rock and roll of the time. But in the short story ends when he overdoses and dies backstage after the first set, right? And uh, leading one observer to, to note that self-destructive is as self-destructive does and a change of scenery does not alter the case. So that's kind of the, I guess the, uh, maybe the parable here, right? And it's something like, something that my seventh grade world history teacher, I still remember her telling us this on the first day of class, history does not repeat itself, human nature does. So with this opening, both about kind of, I guess, a bit about, a little bit about the history of, of, of opera, at least from this one particular extraordinarily talented, unfortunate, and died very young composer, um, to, this idea that really a lot of, you know, opera is, is one of these kind of total art forms that tries to kind of help us gain a, a, a glimpse into, into kind of the human condition, right? And so with this, we're going to talk about kind of adding opera with a laptop orchestra into a laptop opera. So Anne, laptop opera, um, what is a laptop opera? Okay, the very short answer is that it is a laptop or, or a laptop orchestra, which is um, it's an orchestra created from laptops. It's based on um, Dan Truman's kind of original conception of um, using this hemispherical speaker that you can see in this photo. So this is Kun Moon. It's next to his foot. You'll see like a hemispherical thing. It's a six channel speaker um, and it's meant to radiate kind of like an instrumental body. So one of the problems that kind of needed to be answered with laptop music, or for some it needed to be answered, was um, how do we get this music out in a way that the performers can be responsive? And how can the performers actually hear what just they are playing rather than sending everybody out through two-channel speakers or house sound? Um, and so these hemispherical speakers really answer this problem and um, they allow it so that each player can play something different, can hear what they're playing, and then if the depending on how the instrument is designed, they can control their volume level, they can control their frequency, they can control whatever is designed for that instrument, um, but it allows for chamber music, and chamber music is um, essentially responsive and kind of ensemble oriented. So, um, so I was introduced to the Laptop Orchestra in 2006 when I, I started at Princeton for my PhD and um, fell in love with it. And um, it felt like, wow, this is electronic music for chorus. And then um, had a dream way back then of opera for a Laptop Orchestra. And it has taken a long time, but I've finally gotten to work on it. And so, um, so the idea is that this is an opera with traditional singers and laptop players, so people playing instruments based on the laptop, um, 
with individual sounding sex, uh, spaces with the hemispherical speakers and it's got a story and a narrative and it is um it is really looking at something that um that is a story that i think is applicable to today so um this opera is based on um is based on the electra story um which has a lot of different permutations but um so it's a greek tragedy put in present well, it's not put in present day, but put with uh, a laptop orchestra. So maybe uh, let's uh, watch just a clip of this. This is from scene one of Act Three, which was yeah. performed back in June of last year. That's just a short clip from from just scene one, and this is a three act opera. Um, and actually, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to briefly read uh, a blurb that Anne and I have, have have optimized to try to describe this <laughs> of this work that Anne has been working so hard on. And the Furies laptop opera is a retelling of the Greek tragedy Electra, blending a number of versions of the Electra story, including works by Aeschylus. Uh, Sophocles, Euripides, and John Paul Sartre, this retelling explores central questions regarding how communities escape from cycles of violence, the role of guilt and shame in community identity, personal responsibility, how justice interfaces with cycles of violence, and redemption. The artistic medium of the laptop orchestra both serves to recast the traditional instrumental role in a new kind of operatic medium, the laptopera that reimagines the potential of instrument building to support dramatic elements and character relationships, while simultaneously positing critical questions about technology in our lives presently, both in its promise to help us flourish and in its perils to perpetuate and amplify the existing cycles of violence in our world today. And so from this, and I, I, I want to ask you um, specifically about this kind of this this central theme that seems to be in in the laptop or and that is this idea of cycles of violence um and can you tell us a bit really about that and more specific, more generally because you know why did you feel compelled to to write a laptop or a... yeah so um so the story so really quickly the basic story is one where this is a family that's had kind of a history of violence within it for a long time. And when we come to this family, um, the mother has killed the father um, and married the father's brother. Um, she has banished the son um, who, uh, she has banished the son who actually survived but was thought to be killed. And the only, um, other surviving uh, sibling is a daughter who stays with the mother and the stepfather as kind of a servant. And um, Orestes returns and then um, proceeds to kill both his mother and father. And that's kind of the end of the Electra chapter. And then there's a final story. There's a, there's a third play in the series, um, which then is the question is, is it justifiable to kill your mother? Is that, that goes against all moral law. 
So the moment that you saw in the opera is actually when the Furies, who are the ones who support moral law, are surrounding um, Electra and Orestes and are saying um, that they're basically coming after them for this horrible crime. And so what I think this play does beautifully is it really kind of suggests how um, and gets at the root of how do we support moral order without revenge? And that was a big question then. How do we stop basically these cycles of violence? And the answer was having a form of justice or having a form of court case. And I think this is an important question to kind of bring back. I think uh, a lot of people have look, look at this question in a lot of ways. And I think um, we should still be looking at this question um, because these cycles of violence, whether they're overt or whether they're really kind of systemic, are still happening. And we need, I think there needs, I think it's an important thing that we all sit with and question what I think is beautiful about live performance is that when you watch an opera or when you see a piece of art with a group of people that ask these questions, you have a moment to think about it and a moment to ask that question together. And so, um, I mean, even in our present moment, I think there's many questions about the response to COVID-19 and is it a fair response that's protecting all people equally? How is it not protecting some? What's the underlying violence that's really present with our response? And, um, so, and I, th I think these are important questions to ask. So in, in the Furies, right? I mean, the cycles yeah. of violence most directly pertain to the cycle of like literal killing. They are little, yes. Uh, right. I mean, yeah. this is like they've they're they they're they've killed Clytemnestra, their mother, for killing their father, but that's also for earlier killing um, yes. of their for daughter. Yes, the killing of their daughter. Right, yes. and so the, but in, but this is metaphorical, or at least this this violence that you, the cycles of violence that you, you're engaging with doesn't certainly does not is not limited to kind of this very clear physical violence, but all kinds of violence, uh, in my understanding, right? I mean, I would imagine yeah. like if you're in an abusive relationship, for example, that would be a kind of cycle of violence that is, and, and I think in some ways, like I think the, the role of this opera seems to be exactly as you said, to pose the questions about thinking about being aware of these cycles of violence, but also I think thinking through how do we, how can we possibly break the cycle, right? And that's the, that's the hard part. Well, I think, so, uh, yeah, I would agree with that. And I would say that um, I, I, the ending of this opera has always been a challenge for me. So it has an ending, but I've always felt unsettled because the ending is kind of a question. Um, there's Apollo, um, is the god of love and Apollo and justice and he comes out at the end it questions whether he should have done more to guide the family to a better answer whether he should have have done more for humanity to guide humanity to a better answer um, and my dream ending if we were to have an act four would have been movement together at the rope so Katie and I were talking about a fourth act of movement alone and this idea of of what it is to be healed from violence to be together um what it is to find answers together through movement and through listening and this moment together and bringing all the characters of the story together so um i i I think the sitting with the ants, sitting with the questions is is sometimes the hardest part. Right, and I, I think that's what I think that's what art tries to do is not so much tell you, hey, here's a solution, but rather here are are a way to look at the questions, right? And yeah, and I would say there's a lot of pressure right now for a solution. Like I, I think, um, you know, I've I. I've been with a lot of others who don't think it's enough to just pose questions, but really think 
artists should be giving answers and, and answers that we can work with and move forward with right now. Um, and I, I hear that and I, I agree with that. And yet there's a part of me that thinks being careful and, and thoughtful with our answers and a little bit slow might be wise. Um, or there's place for both. Yeah. So um, hold that thought because let's let's bring some more voices into yeah. this conversation. Um, and uh, with us for our fireside chat is Elena Georgieva and Camille Nufi. Elena and Camille, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. It's good to see everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. And Camille, nice. how are you? Um, I echo that. It's so good to see everyone's faces. It's so good to see your faces. And uh, yeah, doing pretty good. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a while since the, the the laptop or team has been in the same room together, and but previous to that, kind of the group has been in the same room together almost week, pretty much weekly, <laughs> working on everything, now from rehearsals to building instruments. So Elena and Camille, um, if tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and also kind of your roles in the laptop Uh, yeah, my name's. Uh... I a lecturer in the music department. I teach the sound recording classes at Karma, and I also did my master's degree there. I finished in 2019, and I'm also a singer and vocal producer. Um, music means a lot to me, and I helped out with the instrument design for the Loft Opera, which is basically the idea of coding instruments and creating these instruments specifically the way um, Anne has envisioned them. And I also sang and performed in a few small roles in the opera. Um, and along with Elena, um, I, um, I was on the instrument building team and I guess, um, before I get into that, I am a second year PhD student at Karma. Um, I am a singer, many different types of music. Um, I sing traditional opera like arias, um, and I've pretty much always been involved in some sort of like group singing and I think that's what um, attracted Elena and I both so much to working on this project with Anne was that we already felt this like sense of magic of like not just singing but singing together and telling a story together um, and I think we really wanted to dig into that a little bit more so yeah so I um, built coded up a lot of the instruments um, along with Anne and designed kind of the whole the connection of body movement into you know writing tech that ultimately produces sound um, and then I also sing, sing in the opera as well. Yeah. yeah in fact, in the clip, we saw the two of you um, sing and uh, sing beautifully. Um, and in working on this, y'all have y'all have written a lot of code. I mean, Camille, you have. <laughs> oh. uh, I mean, you two have been working on the, for Act Three, the the first you know kind of iteration of the instruments for that. And since then, Camille, I mean, you have been kind of our, you've been the instrument design lead since that time and with a lot of other contributors helping with that. Um, what was it like kind of translating kind of, you know, what you thought had to be in an instrument for the laptop opera and, and actually making that happen? Um, and we can talk about any specific instruments. Or we can talk about the rope, um, or, you know, how, what was what was that like kind of writing both being a performer and also an instrument designer in the laptop era? um it definitely evolved so we did we started with act three um and then we moved to act one and then we finished with act two in terms of developing it and the process grew and changed and we learned so so much like with each new act that we started um and the process usually was um so Anne really had the vision of like the music. She was the composer and um, we, she would bring to us these ideas of, of the type of like physical embodiment of the music um, that she was envisioning and kind of the, um, also the sound. So like the, the types of electronic instruments um, that would go along with, with the singing. And um, sometimes there would be ideas of movement already like with the rope you know, everyone's at this rope and we're moving it up and down and we're, we're encircling, um, encircling these people that we want to like, really like bring this idea of like guilt, like down onto them. And so this idea of like bringing this rope up and almost, it's kind of like that parachute that people maybe played with in elementary school, like bringing this weight down on them. Um, so sometimes the, the, 
body movement came first. Sometimes the sound samples um, came first, but I think the beautiful part of it is, is the feedback loop that not only ends up happening in the live performance, but also in the design process. And that's what made this maybe so different than the way other operas are written is it's not just one gets written and then the other and then the other is it, it constantly gets revised. And we got a lot more courageous and maybe unwieldy with like our ideas as we went along. Like the first, the third act seems so tame compared to like what we were trying to do um, just this last uh, winter quarter. Um, yeah, and the coding is like a little, just a little part of it. I think what surprised me the most was I came into it really about like this idea of like group singing and, and by the end of it, it was all about the body. And it was all about like, what is this body to sound mapping that really conveys this meaning that, or this embodied metaphor that we want to get across. Yeah. So I think there's a question on stream is how the machines were all synchronized. For example, during the clip we saw, there was the kind of the, 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 rit the percussion, right? And those were coming from all the different laptops and their speakers. And the short answer is to that is it was, I mean, you wrote, you and Elena wrote instruments that were, that were synchronized through open sound control. And actually one of the inventors of open sound controls, Matt Wright is actually in chat, uh, also helping to answer questions. Mm -hmm. So, hey, Matt, how are you doing? Um, thanks for joining us as always and being ever so helpful. And thanks for open sound control. We use that a lot. Um, and uh, so actually you spoke of embodying metaphor. Let's go back to kind of the first instrument that we all experience as part of this, and that is the rope. And this is something that I know Anne has been working with for quite, like almost over a decade now, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. Um, Anne, do you wanna say a bit about the rope and how that works? Yeah, well, I what I think is, what was really fun with the rope on this project is, um, so I started the rope a long time ago as an answer to a question of how can I create a controller that is for multiple people um, and I was like oh if we attach these tether strings if you look at the bottom of this picture you'll see these little boxes oh he just moved it but if, sorry uh, there it is there or yeah so you'll see these little boxes between the people and they're actually strings that come up from that box and attach to the rope and that sends an X Y or Z location so uh, X Y or length information about where the tether is and then i could uh so the first version of the rope 10 years ago was basically using that information to say that if the rope is pulled at a certain rate um it will and for a certain amount of time it will make a certain kind of sound so kind of like drawing a bow over a string it has to go at a certain rate to really produce sound um and then with this project, it was so fun to start working with Camille and Elena because we were like, oh, we want this beat to come in. So at the rope, there's no OSC. There's no server. There's nothing managing that things are happening together with the chord sound. That's only the fact that people are playing it together. But then the rhythmic patterns are controlled through a server. So we, had, we were able to get this kind of dual control happening and then you can't see it so well in this video, but later versions, we also started changing the way we played the rope, which got super exciting. So we were doing it so that depending on the location of those tethers, it would change the volume of the beat being played and the different beat patterns were played by different machines. So if the rope moved almost like a Ouija board, like moved, moved in kind of a whole movement, it would um, basically make the, the beat sound change location and you can get this beautiful kind of sound spatialization of the beat through the movement of the rope itself by controlled by all players simultaneously um, and that was all figured out together which was so much fun yeah so um i mean it seems like this is a kind of interface or an instrument that is that you can both contribute to your own kind of own local kind of agency, but also you have to have to move with the group because if the rope gets pulled from you, you're going to move the rope and you have neighbors on the rope, right? So it's a, I mean, it's a, I think this works so well because, it, well, it needs bodies in the room. This is something that yes. needed people to physically be next to one another. 
one issue that, I had with the person who was yeah. next to me at the rope, I was next to um, a tall man, and when, when he would like lift it, um, he li- would lift the rope too high for me. Oh. oh. And then, um, so we had to coordinate. He and I had to work on this to make sure that we could play the rope together and that the height difference wouldn't be something that affected our performance. Great. Actually, uh, I was just going to ask you, Elena, how was it like performing on on the rope? And, uh, but that's, I mean, that's exactly it, is that I think there was a, it, it is really a give and take, and, and I think it's designed to be that way. Um, so that's just one of, I don't know, how many instruments are there, different instruments are there now in the entirety of the... <laughs> well, I see that apparently, I don't know how Matt did his magic and queued up the scripts, but apparently there are 25,000 lines <laughs> of code. That's amazing. Which I can't, I like am shocked by that. So a lot there. That's what I was saying. I was like, it just grew and grew every act. We, we learned so much and then, and then continued to just get bolder and bolder with like the way we wanted to control stuff. Um, I just wanted to say one thing about the rope before we um, move on compared just as, as both a designer of the instruments and also a player of a lot of them is the thing that's special about the robe is it, it maybe felt the most like chamber music, I guess. Mm. Um, and that is because everybody, you, everybody has such an agency in their part, but it has to work together. And you're making these like instantaneous choices that other people don't have to respond to. Like if I pull really hard on the rope and someone else isn't ready and they, you know, go lax on the other side, they'll fall forward. And, and, and it's all this stuff that you have to um, adjust to and respond to both with your body and also based on what you want to hear or produce musically um, without like speaking at all, you know, it's like the opposite of the way we're interacting over zoom, I guess, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and it's instantaneous and it's completely nonverbal. And it's the more you, we played together with a certain group of people, the more musical it got because we got this sort of interconnectedness that I think completely just came out of like gesture and respond. Um, yeah. And not every instrument is designed like that one. They're all so different, but that one, I think the felt like the most like playing a traditional kind of chamber music instrument. And I miss it a lot. It's so great to see these photos. <laughs> and uh, so while we, on that note, right? I mean, we 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 played act, we performed Act Three, we performed Act One back in December. We we're just about to premiere the full opera, like in March, in the mid March. And when that's that's when COVID hit and shelter in place and a lot of things, a lot of things happened and. I don't know, Anne. I mean, we're. I think someone on streams like hope to see it live one day. I'm, you of all people, I imagine, would oh. love to see this. <laughs> I it's well. I think uh, yes, it it will happen. I am absolutely sure it will happen. Um, I want it to be in front of an audience. I really don't want to do it just for video, and so that may mean waiting a while. Um, but. Uh, it's a really special work and there was so much that went behind it and act two is the most that's where everything happens um so i am excited to see the whole thing the other thing is we none of us had we hadn't even done a full run so none of us have experienced the whole thing together i think a nice lesson that was learned from this is that a lot of being a performer a lot of being a musician is the experience in the rehearsal um, and that's what we have to enjoy and that's that's a big part of the performance and that the actual performance, those two hours, is a very small part of the experience of being a musician. We have to all remember that. Well, yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you, thank you all so much. And uh, I just want to say as part of just as one member of, of the team and uh, and with, with Anne kind of at the helm of all of this, it has been a ride. And I have so, like, this amount of energy and passion that everyone has brought to it. It's, uh, this is going to happen. Yeah, we don't know when it's it gonna happen. Happening. It's gonna happen. <laughs> um, there, are, this would be a good time if anyone had any questions for any of our our uh, our guests here about laptop or embodiment. This is the time. And for our last segment, as we type questions in here, um, I thought we'd get with Anne lead us in a yeah. in a uh, in a brief kind of a group exercise that's uh, related to sound. Anne. Yes. It. So. Um... 
So I first met Pauline Oliveros in 2001. She was a professor of mine at Mills College when I did my master's there. Um, she's some consider her the mother of electronics. I do. Um, she's a brilliant thinker and she began um, kind of a program and, and a practice called deep listening. And I study, I still study that practice. Um, and it's her, what she came down to later in life was that the most important thing that we learn as musicians is how to listen. And that this is fundamental to being a musician and it's fundamental to being a human. Um, and so I wanted to lead us in um, just a guided listening. So part of the practice is you listen. And to do this, we're going to get our bodies ready because she strongly believed that the body is a full, uh, that listening is a full bodied experience. So we're just going to do some small stretches. Let's all lift our arms up, breathing in and exhaling out. Another one, deep breath in, arms up. Exhaling out. And one more deep breath in. Exhaling out. And then really try to set that posture. So we're going to listen for two minutes and it will be surprising how long two minutes may feel like. But um, she would often give some guiding to the listening. You can think of listening as having an internal component. We can listen to what is within us, whether it's within our mind or within our heart or even in our bodies, our body sounds. And we can listen to what is external from us. And we can listen in a way that is global, where we are open to all sounds that are happening. And we can listen in a way that's focused, where we can follow one sound and see where it goes. And so you can choose any of those ways of listening. Um, but I'm going to set a timer for two minutes. And um, when we come to the end of the time, we're going to share what we hear. But use this time to um, really enjoy what it is to listen. And so, so and just to clarify, I think yeah. it sounds like our assignment for the next two minutes when after you begin it is just to listen deeply to our surroundings to whatever there is to listen to is that the just to yeah and she would it's funny because i'm seeing something listening is hearing she would often say listening is not hearing listening is our mind engaging and kind of our engagement with sound hearing is kind of the physical action um and she has a beautiful book called software for people where she talks about all these things and i love that title um, but yes, yeah, so we are just going to open ourselves to listening. That's our only job for the next two minutes. Um, so here we go.
And that's it. Our two minutes is over. So here we are back. Aww. How does everyone feel? Perry says, sad it's over. I feel more calm. <laughs> yeah, what are things you heard that you, that's surprising? I love the, the refrigerator had an aria. <laughs> refrigerator had an aria. Really cool. One thing I, I could not help but notice was the absence of planes flying overhead. I would hear them all the time here. I think I'm in the landing path to, to the airport and I, I don't hear any. I don't hear the, the, the kind of Doppler glissando of, the, of planes overhead. And I hear, I hear the fan of my computer and, uh, and a little ringing in my ear. <laughs> So I think this is actually our, our episode for today. Um, any further thoughts or questions or sentiment of anyone? We're going to stay on for just a few more minutes. And I think that was kind of our dance. We're not going to, I think that was kind of our, our sonic dance. And maybe if you feel a sense of calm and, and, uh, and solitude, maybe take that with you, you know, kind of from this for the rest of, of the day and, uh, and cogitate on that. All right. I feel like everyone is like 50% lower energy and calmer. I'm looking at the gallery. People are barely moving. Mm. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining this episode of Artful Design Television. Thank you, Anne, Elena, Camille, for being part of this. And thanks to everyone for being a part of this. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, stay artful. We're signing off. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Girl.